This podcast contains potentially adult language, adult themes, definitely drinking, and possibly sexual context. Listener discretion is advised. Switching oh, wonderful. Over. Switching over to a frag in my my mother's Packers cup. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, hi, see, I, I, okay. Wait, I have to start the podcast and then we'll go to this. Okay, this is drinking with authors, literary briefs edition. I'm your host, Erica Lance. My co-host today is the amazing Mark Muncy from Erie, Florida, and our guest today is Matt Forbeck. Woo! Okay, hello. Matt people. is in Wisconsin and was just showing up Packers. So my uncle, who's who passed away. Um, was such a huge Packers fan. Like he was one of those die hard, no matter how bad it got kind of Packers fans that if you brought anything up, even remotely, you know, I, I was like, oh, and I was very young. And when I grew up in California, my mom wasn't a huge sports fan. So when we moved to Wisconsin, this was like my introduction. Oh to yeah. Sports <laughs> I was like, and he was like, cheese heads. And I'm like, why would, what, <laughs> why would you call yourselves that? Like, <laughs> because you get the best hats, right? Yeah, I, I, yes. But it was so funny seeing how, like, going from nothing to this, like, oh, oh and I was like, oh my goodness. Now, the Packers are fucking saints here. We're, they're adored beyond all others, right? The, the real reason is because the Packers are in the smallest media market of all professional teams of any sport. And they are not owned by a corporation or a person. They are owned by the city, yep. which is actually illegal to do. The contract the NFL has with all the other owners says there's actually a Packers clause that says you cannot do this ever again, right? That means that the Packers can never leave. We don't have to worry about them wandering off to some other city or getting leverage for a new stadium or whatever. In fact, the last time they had a new stadium, they basically said, we're going to sell non-voting stock to anybody in Wisconsin. And people are like, I am now a Packers owner. And they had their own certificate on the wall. doesn't mean a goddamn thing. But they were happy to give money to the Packers just to be the Packers, right? Because we love them. They're great folks. My favorite team of all time. And, and now we're into Packerville. Okay. So rapid fire questions. You ready? Mm -hmm. You don't have to be. It's fine. Not at all. It's going to go anyway. We so. didn't say what we're drinking. What? Oh, oh, we yeah. didn't we're drinking. oh forgot. Mark, thank you for keeping us on task. Hey, so that's why I'm here. the designated driver tonight. So. I see that. Okay. I have, it's true. I totally was like getting into a conversation. I have breakfast stout, which has a somewhat terrifying baby on it, but it's double so chocolate, crazy. coffee, oatmeal. Look at how scary that is. I can't tell whether they're being forced. But I don't know what's happening there. Um, but it's a double chocolate coffee, oatmeal stout. It's like got a lot of things. It's very good, but it's anyway, Mark. What are you yep. drinking from Coffee Shop of Horrors? Which by uh, this point is should the, be uh, sending me coffee. I, my light isn't showing very well. It's the Caramel Scream. Uh, coffee Shop of Horrors is here in uh, Montvert. Not Montverde because we're not fancy enough here in Florida. It's Montvert. <laughs> and um, uh, again, we like to name things too down here. Uh, and they uh, they do organic coffees and they make all these crazy blends all based on different horror films and things. This is the Caramel Scream. So it looks like the Scream. And it Where is, is your coffee? Where, wasn't your coffee supposed to come out soon? The Eerie Florida, Florida blend is in the works. So ah, nice. They, they got to figure out how to get the orange to taste right. And that's, how, that's when you've us. arrived, man. That's awesome. That's yeah, you, know, no. you know, that's a that's a thing. Yeah, exactly. That's bucket list check <laughs> right there. So coffee Matt, named after. Drinking? Oh, Matt, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Lafred. Oh, is a Ooh. pretty goddamn great single malt Scotch whiskey. Uh, actually, my friend, Bill, uh, William King, I was mentioning in a previous podcast here, William King was my roommate when I was working at Games Workshop in Nottingham. He came out for my wedding uh, back in 1992, yeah, now 92, because I'm an old man, and this was what he brought me as a wedding gift. So, uh, now I've gone through that bottle and a few others since then, but this oh, is- Oh, I was going to say that <laughs> bottle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, yeah, it's a very special podcast, but it's not that special because yeah. I already drink 30 year old it. scotch. Oh, dang, man. Yeah, I was gonna say, wow, I feel I'm incredibly flattered. No, no, and... uh, Bill, I, I was actually at a bar with Bill in Nottingham with a couple of American students that we had met at a bar. And he's like, I'm gonna buy you all a round of shots, right? And we're like, okay, great. So, me and the two American girls, we pick up the shots and go, here we go, cheers, and we slam them back. And the look of absolute horror on the man's face that we would actually slam sipping scotch at that point he was ready to kill us all he was just but he was 
befuddled that anybody would actually ever do that, right? But we're American. Yeah, I was just fresh out of college and the others were college students, at, transfer students at Nottingham at the time. We had no idea. But he yes. is, you learned me well. I know, see, Pinky's out. So Look at you. I was going to say, you're holding that perfectly. Okay, we're, we need to get to rapid fire questions. Mark, you derailed me. I was on a trajectory. Sorry, Sorry. I just what? didn't want to break the format, you know, hey. Whatever, it's my show. It doesn't have to have a format. Well, not no, only to keep us honest, it's good. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the first question is, what is your favorite book of all time? Oh, uh, probably The Lord of the Rings, just because I've read it over and over and I actually worked in the Lord of the Rings role-playing game and uh, it's the inspiration for Shotguns and Sorcery, one of them. Um, the other stuff that uh, one of my favorite books is The Big Sleep by Raymond Chandler, right? Which I'm very, very influenced by hard-boiled detective fiction, which is also another reason for Shotguns and Sorcery. Uh, I like how you that, tied all that in there that was well i did done. I'm, I'm a marketing but, genius there science fiction's neuromancer right william gibson holy shit blew my mind as a teenager still blows my mind today great writer okay what about the worst book of all time for you i can't say oh well, it's someone you know <laughs> somebody who's alive uh, one for one it would be i no i just i don't believe in in uh in destroying other writers right but as much fun as it might be when i if if we were alone in a bar and there's nothing recording i might tell you but here i would not say because honestly anybody who's willing to put their stuff out there to do the creative work to get it out there fund publishers are willing to fund it and everything else i don't feel like i should be ripping them to pieces for doing that right i applaud their efforts and if their book was not for me that's fine right i'm i'm not the audience for every book um, and that's just the way it is. But I, I don't, I go out of my way to make sure I don't rip other creatives publicly because of that. That makes sense. A lot of times in the basis of this question usually has to do with it's not the book for you or based on the age of the people on this podcast presently. Mine was a book I was forced to read in a high school on a reading list. Like there were books that they're not, and it's not necessarily because it, that is not my least favorite book now. Mine is something else, but um, it's a lot of times it's the, the book, like any books that have um, uh, alabaster skin in them are Mark's favorite books of all time. His that favorite. Seems fair. My trigger name. word. <laughs> That's trigger it's a trigger word. word. It's fun to watch. But if you I really read that, I'm just like, Mark, really? You got to have another word. Come on. There's, there's no, more please. adjectives. Come on. <laughs> but no, I totally get it. Okay. What is your favorite book to movie or TV show? Oh, again, Lord of the Rings, probably, right? Uh, just because uh, I think the Peter Jackson's trilogy was fantastic. I'm, not The Hobbit, which I'm not as excited about, but the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the original films were fantastic, even the extended editions, right? Um, uh, the adaptations, the way he managed to cut things down and streamline things and, and come up with some new characters, but really focus on what was most important about the books, I thought was fantastic. That's probably a, a stock answer for any fantasy writer, but it's still true for me. Well, no, I think a, I think he did really well. I think there's, you know, Tolkien fans kind of go on both sides of that particular thing mm -hmm. because, you know, a lot of people only saw the movies and didn't read the books and are like all this stuff right. and don't realize some of the dynamics that were changed slightly. But I'll, then if you read the books, there's a lot of walking in those books. <laughs> exactly. A lot of walking, a lot of eating, right? So yeah, yeah which you can do. And if you're doing Game of Thrones, you can stop and do a meal for a TV show or two. But when you're doing a movie, probably not such a great idea. Actually, the I remember the movie I loved the most that was based upon a short story that uh, really transformed it was Blade Runner, right? Blade okay. Runner is one of my favorite films of all time. And based on Do Androids Dream of uh, Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick. And Dick's stories have been translated into all sorts of different films, right? But that's probably the best of them all. And uh, the transformation between the original story and retaining a lot of the stuff that made the original story pretty goddamn cool, but still then expanding beyond that and really breathing life into what would become cyberpunk uh, is just amazing stuff. Agreed. What about one that you were like, oh, I, you wanted it to be so good and then it wasn't good when they translated it into... Okay, this one I think is uncontroversial. I'm, I'm, I'm drunk enough oh, to not I'm, be. I'm not even going there. I'm going to take another <laughs> sip of my uncontroversial, okay. uncontroversial would be the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Yes. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I think even the actors in that who are chewing scenery for I a mean, paycheck. 
would you gotta not give Jeremy say Irons credit. He did what he could with it, man. Yeah. You got to give him credit. That was, you know, and I actually knew the guy who directed the film, right? Oh, oh God. And he had actually gotten the, the rights from uh, Lorraine Williams. Actually, she was running TSR. He got them like for, for in, perpetu in perpetuity. Uh, so they've had to negotiate that with, now with the people who are actually producing a new uh, Dungeons and Dragons film to, you know, say, okay, now we need to take this and move it on to something else. Um, but uh, Corey was, you know, he's a good guy. He actually ran a company that published Traveler for a while mm. and uh, did some interesting stuff there. And this, when he did the Dungeons and Dragons movie, that was his first movie he had ever directed or right. produced. And in that sense, it's a fucking triumph, right? Uh, the, van the fact that he got to get like Thor Birch and Jeremy Irons and a bunch of other fantastic actors in there to do some amazing stuff. One of the Wayans brothers is in there. I forget. I yeah. blotted out parts of this. Um, I just think it fell short. Right. And I, I think he would probably agree with me on that. So, you know, what's interesting about that, though, is when it comes to those kind of things, I think now actors, when you're bringing up something that is superhero like or mythical like, because so many actors screwed the pooch on like Matrix and you know what I mean? Like uh, Lord of the Rings, like they had an opportunity and they didn't get it. And they were like, oh, I'm going to pass on that. Now, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, people will just sign <laughs> up for anything it seems like that because they're afraid like if somebody yeah. says the word marvel movie i think people just sign they're like it was, it was oh, my exactly. bad it was post you know post post star wars everybody wanted to be the next star wars i mean that's why we got all the fun buckaroo bonsais and things like that that were, were great but we're just never quite that par but you know so everybody signed us because everybody wanted to be in the next one that's why we got flash gordon with those amazing british actors you know you know it's such a i am blessed and flash gordon holy shit yep that was how i knew so i made good. it as an author was when brian blessed gave me a shout out <laughs> oh nice <laughs> he's like so it's coffee like, and done. him giving had, you a shout out yep oh, i had to call wow. everybody on that one man that was amazing <laughs> i'll bet you know what one i just recently listened to again on audiobook was jurassic park Oh, yeah. And it's interesting because that one made me angry again when I was thinking about the movie because I was driving with a friend of mine in the car and back to Florida and it was a long trip and we were listening to the and, and he's a huge dinosaur fan and he's like, this would have been a much different movie. I said it would have been a rated R movie yep. if they'd actually made it kind of to what the point of the book was. And he's like, I wish they'd make a rated R. I'm like, they're not going to do that because now dinosaurs and major motion pictures are for kids. You yeah, can't, you just can't do it anymore. Like you can't put dinosaurs into horrific situations like that was, you know, with not three raptors, but 12 raptors. Yeah, and more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all the raptors. All the raptors. Okay. Um, Mark, what's your question? I've asked all the questions so far. All right. You've asked so far. All right, I, I gotta say, uh, so for, for role-playing games, we, we asked in the previous podcast, you know, what was some of your favorites and stuff. Uh, I would, I'm going to go back to your, your, your choose your own adventure books, or I'm sorry, endless quest. Okay. Books. Uh, when you were, you That's know, a trademark there, buddy. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I went the wrong way. Went the wrong way. Netflix, please don't sue me. Uh, but, uh, well, no, they were the ones who got sued by that one. Exactly. Uh, by Chusco. Uh, no, uh, when you were doing the Endless Quests, uh, did you go back to the old ones or did you, how were you inspired? You know, no, I, I had read some of the old ones back in the day. I'd read some of the Middle Earth ones that, uh, that Iron Crown did. I had read some of the Choose Your Own Adventure stuff. So I was pretty familiar with the, with the whole genre. So I did not, when I got the assignment, I did not go back and read the original books. Uh, for one, the assignment was very tricky in that um, they were shorter books. They were 128 pages. And the thing that nobody knows, because we didn't announce it ever, but I've told this story a couple different times before, is that they wanted to also have the option to do a mass market version that was 96 pages. So those books actually have the ability to have 20, well, 28 pages, or whatever, ripped out of them. Wow. <laughs> Excuse crazy. me, I'm sneezing. I just became allergic Bless to you. my hair. Every time you uh, get to a point in the, in the endless quest books where there's three choices in the mass market version there would only be two choices <laughs> so um but you know those were a challenge right mostly because uh the interesting thing about uh pick a path adventures like that is not so much how you succeed it's how you fail right, right. you want to lure people into failing and then murder them callously and dramatically and spectacularly and then have them say damn it and then go back to where they marked the book the last place right um, so even the failure states have to be the most entertaining thing, which is, you know, the funny part is probably the, the win state is the dullest entry in the entire book. 
the the death states the fail states are actually the best one around. i was uh recently going back through some old uh the old what was it, the fighting fantasy series which were much oh, yeah. role-playing where you actually had to roll dice and stuff and you had your character bookmark and all that and i was like oh, i wonder if they thought about that for these but they didn't so no 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 we actually went with the original uh format which was just pick a path right i think part of it is because uh you know if you want to do solo D D adventures back in the day they actually did publish some of those right and nowadays you can just do that yourself if you want to there's a lot of different ways plus there's all these uh, uh visual novels you know, mostly out of japan and such nowadays that you know in video games so there's a lot of different options for that but uh they want to do something that was you know uh, kid level, you know, chapter book type level, a little bit higher than that, middle grade, and uh, and give them something they can enjoy and have some fun with and and learn how these kind of things work as opposed to doing something too complex. Awesome. Although I had right, so. shitloads of questions about it. People are like, are you going to do this? I'm like, mm, nah, not the assignment. I agree with that not being the assignment. You know, we're going to sell these like through scholastic book fairs, guys. This is not going to be, you know, we don't want the kids to have to actually have 20 sided dice as they pick it up. No tomb of horrors. Then. Exactly. <laughs> DM yes, please. So <laughs> okay, I got a good one. What is your favorite module to run? My favorite module to run? Oh man, yeah. the Lost Minds of Fandelver, which is the latest uh D, D introductory set. I have probably run that six times already, right? Oh. Um, it's just a it's actually a really goddamn good bit of design. It, it, it teaches you how to not only to how to play the game, but how to run a game and then do a really good job with it as far as introducing characters to different types of conflict and different types of uh, you know, do you roll a die to persuade the person here? Do you roll a die to uh, attack them? Do you just have a conversation? Do you want to plot, plot tactics as you're going through it? Um, you know, all this kind of strategy you're going to do. They do a really good job with it. Um, probably before that, I mean, uh, Christ, I mean, I just ran Brave New World Forever is what I did. So the superhero role-playing game I wrote, I wrote, I did dozens of versions of that. Nowadays, it's the shotguns and sorcery thing, which we're going to actually run at game hole con i wrote an adventure for that that uh we then and i turned into a short story and i uh we ended up running at conventions for years right and it's just like little thing where zombies burst into your favorite bar and what the hell why did that happen let's figure this out so after you kill the zombies of course <laughs> well unless you're making friends with them cardio no yeah. um so what about when you're right when you're doing novels and stuff do you plot are you a pantser do you outline like I outline my books. I started out as a, because I started out doing tabletop role-playing games for hire, essentially for Wizards, for Dungeons and Dragons, TSR, Wizards of the Coast and other companies. Uh, essentially when you do these kind of things, they would either give you an outline to work from or they would ask you to come up with one, right? And sometimes these even were down to what they call page plans where they actually had a diagram that had every page in the book in it where they would write what was gonna happen in that book. And then you had to come up with an outline that was based upon that, right? Um, so you know there's gonna be six pages on this, two pages on this, one page on this, whatever, on different topics. And uh, because I got used to doing that, I realized that um, for me at least, I, I respect people who can do it by the seat of their pants, but uh, for me at least, the big challenge with doing a book is not uh, how you write it, but what you're gonna write about, right? So if you sit down and do the outline ahead of time, you've actually gotten most of the hard stuff of writing out of the way, the plotting that would otherwise give you problems. Uh, now, on the other hand, the way I do it is because I have friends who sit down and write a 40,000 word outline for a 100,000 word book, right? Or an 80,000 word book. And I'm like, you have just sucked all the goddamn fun out of this, number one. And number two is if you come up with a better idea somewhere in between while you're actually writing this stuff, you're going to feel so beholden to the work that you did before, you're not going to be willing to throw that out. So what I like to do is a very loose outline that's basically two or three lines per chapter. I'll figure out how many chapters in a book. Let's let's say it's 100,000 words and each chapter is 5,000 words. That means I need to do 20 chapters in the book, right? Usually it's 2,500 words in a chapter. I'm doing 40 chapters for a book. So I will then sit down and do an outline that's probably 30 to 35 chapters, knowing that occasionally I will overwrite those chapters. And so I'm giving myself some breathing room for that, right? Something will just attract me. I'll be excited about this. I'll write a little bit more. I'll make another chapter out of it. And... Uh, then as I go along, if a better idea strikes me, I'll go with that idea. I'll just say, fuck it, throw it out, right? Because all I'm throwing out is a few pages worth of work. It's not throwing out half a novel worth of work to have a better idea, right? Yeah. Writing is an act of discovery. So what you're doing as a writer, as much as as a reader, you're discovering what the story is about. And that's part of the fun of it. And if you rob yourself of that, you rob yourself of the incentive and the joy of writing. So I don't want to do that. I want to be able to have something where I still get that joy, but I also don't feel so beholden to the work I've done before that I'm not willing to go with a better idea when it comes along. 
Very cool. Um, when you're writing, do you listen to music? Do you play? What do you have in the background? Anything or is it dead quiet? No, I, I generally listen to music. In fact, I'll come up with playlists for whatever thing I'm working on. Uh, generally, they tend to be instrumentals, right? Um, or soundtracks for different movies and such that I think are in the same genre, the same spirit of the book or that I'm working on. Uh, it's nice if you're working on a tie-in because if I'm writing a Halo novel, I can just write a Halo, you know, Halo movie in the uh, music in the background. Um, I don't try to do stuff with lyrics. If it's stuff with lyrics, it's stuff that I know by heart already, right? It's stuff that I'm a big fan of and I can not think about the lyrics. If it's something new that I don't know the lyrics to, I'm going to be going, what did you just say? Because to me, uh, that verbal part of my brain needs to be focused on what I'm putting on the page. And if it's focused on interpreting what other things are coming at me, I can't do it. Right. I need to be able to write at speed and not be shutting that stuff out because uh, you, you spend part of your brain power just shutting that verbiage, verbiage out. And for that reason, I don't listen to podcasts. I don't watch movies in the background, any of that kind of stuff, because it'll distract me from what I'm doing here. Right. But music that puts me in the mood that triggers an entirely different part of my brain. I'm very happy to, to lean on that. I wrote a bunch of novels just using like the Incredibles soundtrack. Right. They were adventure novels full of good fun. And I'm like, great. You know, this is not an incredible story, but it's got that kind of a feel to it. Right. And like the leverage novel, I think I wrote using the Incredibles soundtrack. I'm like, okay, great. It's that kind of fun adventure, family oriented, not too dark or anything. And to have that going in the back of my brain as I was going was fantastic. What about fans? Let's talk about fans for a moment that approach you other than Mark pulling out every book he owns that you have. That's I fine. Stop pulling out books. It's weird. It's awkward. They're, all, Mark, they're, they're sitting over there now. Okay. Um, but what are fans <laughs> like? When what was the first fan experience that you remember having where somebody walked up and knew exactly who you were and was a fan? Yeah, um, that actually threw me terribly. I was actually just telling the story to a friend of mine earlier today um over lunch. And uh uh the first person I ever asked me for an autograph, I was so shocked I started laughing, right? Just out of like embarrassment for me and him and whoever it was. And I laughed so hard that he ran away. Oh. <laughs> I felt terrible. Like, no, come back. I'll sign the book. It was for Western Hero, the first big role playing game book I ever did. And I was like, holy shit, I, I got to get better at this. Right. Um, but I was just so gobsmacked by the idea that somebody would want my signature on anything, which, of course, if you think about it, is a perfectly natural thing to want. Right. It makes sense. But I was not focused on that part of the whole writing selling experience. I was focused on the creating experience. And the, the fact that somebody would be so excited about seeing me at Gen Con, which is where it happened. And I was standing at the booth where it happened. And the guy's like, did you write this? I'm like, yeah, I wrote that. I'm really excited about it. So can you sign up? I'm like, Bruh. um, and he ran away. I have no idea who it is now. I feel bad for him. Um, you know, it's, it's just a strange thing. And actually I've had people recognize me at home. I've you know, in my hometown, I've had recognized me at restaurants. I go to conventions. I expect to be recognized, but still, if I'm like, you know, at a restaurant away and somebody says, Hey, that's bad for over there. I'm like, Hi, how you doing? Yeah. Um, well, most of the time, you know, most fans are really respectful, sweet people, and they just want to show some appreciation for the stuff you've done. It somehow it touched them in some way, and I'm excited about that, right? Um, and, but the neat thing about games, as opposed to say fiction or film or whatever else, is the line between fan and pro is so blurry that it almost doesn't exist, right? So if I'm writing stuff for games, somebody says I love that game, I'm like, that's great. Did you play it? I really enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun to play, right? Um, or do you have some, you know, are you running something here? Can I get it on the game? That's really the kind of level that it's at where it's very different if you're going into science fiction and fantasy fandom or horror fandom or wherever else where there's kind of this, uh, this visible wall between fans and pros, right? But in tabletop games, it really doesn't exist in a lot of ways, right? Now, at the end of the night, we might end up going out to dinner with our friends as opposed to just some random fan, of course. But, you know, if I meet a fan in a bar, I'm happy to sit and have a drink with them. I'm, you know, honestly we're all there to play games why am i going to worry about whether or not i wrote one and you didn't right no, it's all good to me sense. what is your weirdest fan experience so i've got to ask i don't know most of them are good well i had one guy one time a guy came up and told me in for about 15 minutes how much my game sucked <laughs> and i'm like okay yeah, I'm just thinking, okay, finally you'll get a fucking clue and leave me alone. <laughs> okay, fine. I'm a human being here. <laughs> yeah. wow. um, and I'm like, you know, but he was just one of these guys who uh, just did not have any kind of social cues at all. Uh, we actually had a thing at Pinnacle. A gamer with no social cues? I know. Hard Weird. To believe, right? 
weird. Uh, we had this thing back at with Pinnacle back in the day where if somebody was irritating the shit out of you at the booth, you would just go like this. And that meant, get me the fuck out of here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so whoever was watching would say, hi, hey, I, I need you over here to help count inventory or something or whatever. And uh, this person over here needs to talk to you about sales. And that would rescue you. I mean, it, it, an elegant way of getting out of a conversation. But, um, you know, honestly, 99% of my interactions with, with fans of my work have been fantastically positive things. Um, and some of these people become friends, honestly. I've, uh, I've had people who... Uh, there was a guy named Christian Linke. Um, shout out to Christian. But like I was going to uh, Comic-Con one year. I hadn't been in Comic-Con for a few years. He's like, can I buy you dinner? I'm like, fuck yeah, why not? You buy me, you know, he brought me to a nice steakhouse. We had a great time. We've been friends for years now. His wife actually illustrated one of my kids' books, uh, you know, and the, I would keep up with each other. There's no goddamn reason not to. He's a game designer and a writer in his own right. He does his own things. Um, but, you know, we were at different stages at that point. But I'm like, why would I not treat him like a human being who deserved my time and attention just as much as anybody else? Assuming I had that time to spare at that point. And I did. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that the difference with authors, then I won't say every person I've met, you know, I've met a lot of celebrities. It's very interesting to me, meet celebrities who, especially like horror movie conventions and stuff where maybe they're not huge names, but one time I had Barry Boswick sit and talk to me for 20 minutes and I finally had to tell him that there were other people in line that wanted to talk to him. And then it was amazing. But like, he went into a whole thing about the fact that I write and writing screenplays and, yeah. and he, was, he was hysterical, but I was finally like, there are other people like right there that want to talk to you who are like, yeah. Well, if you meet people like that that are outside of the context of a line of people waiting to see them you really can connect with them right i um, i did a, a novelization from um, a movie called mutant chronicles which is based on a role-playing game i worked out back in the 90s out of sweden right um the same guys i ended up working on for the Biomutant mutant game uh, eventually and uh i got invited out to the red carpet movie premiere in hollywood right because i'd written the novelization for the book and i got went to the after party with my wife we had a great time and i'm sitting there with uh you know, Devin Naki and uh, Ron Perlman and all these other guys, and we're having a great time. And it just, and I'm like, hey, could you guys sign my book that I wrote with your characters in it? Because I'm going to take this home and I can be excited about it. Um, and, you know, we just got all fanboyed over each other. It was fun, right? Uh, but there's no reason, you know, but you also know that, like, at the same time, we're having drinks and Ron's smoking a big fucking stogie and we're having a great time. You know, it's just, you're all human beings at the end of the day. We're all going to walk home and go to bed and, and uh, have to do some, get up and do some crazy shit tomorrow to make a living. So. No, totally. And I think it's actually, I had a great, great moment. I went to Megacom this year to get Ron Perlman and Mike Roker signature and Mike Roker comes over and is gives us a hug and with to Ron Perlman and they're talking and I was like photograph I do not need a photograph with both of them I just had a fangirl collision of two amazing people but you know it's really interesting because I met Mike Roker at a spooky empire we had a very bizarre interaction and then he was like oh hi blah 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 and I'm like I met you once before blah and he goes I remember you yeah I'm not sure if that I would be one of the weird interactions he had, but it was it was just when people are like that, and I think authors tend to be much more real to for their sure. interactions because we're just as excited we've impacted your yeah. life as the fan who wants to come tell us about it. Well, I mean, plus also, I mean, if, if you're talking about versus like movie or television stars, nobody recognizes an author. Right. I mean, you can walk down the street, nobody pokes you and says, oh, that's that. It's very rare that somebody will actually point you out. And it has happened, happened to me a couple of times, but it's pretty rare. Um, whereas like uh, Will Wheaton's a friend of mine. Right. I've known him for quite some time. We haven't talked for you know, years now, but uh, we still communicate with each other occasionally. But um, like back about 20 years at Comic-Con, we met with each other and we swapped books. You know, he gave me one of his memoirs. I gave him a Blood Bowl novel. He was a big Blood Bowl fan. I loved his work in Star Trek. And we just kept up with each other. Um, but, you know, in that kind of a context where you're literally we're like meeting on the floor of Comic-Con and nobody is looking at us, it's just the two of us talking about books. That's a great thing. Right. Yeah. And then you end up doing stuff. I ended up working on his uh, he did a role playing game setting he did with Tabletop that Green Ronin published. And I wrote a, part, a small portion of that. Um, but, you know, and that's a, that's actually how I got the leverage now. I ended up meeting John Rogers at Comic-Con and we were both I was a fan of his blog. He was a fan of my work in gaming. And, you know, uh, last time uh, I was in L.A., I had uh, uh, we went out and did an L.A. lunch with each other at some uh, like the Brown Derby or whatever the fuck it was. 
And I'm like, John, you should be doing novels. He's like, introduce me to some editors. I'm like, here we go. Two years later, I get a book, right? So I'm like, and it wasn't even my, uh, you know, if I had not written the book, if I had not been part of it, that would have been fine. Uh, but I just was happy to see leverage novels out there, right? Yeah. I was excited about that because I love the show. I, I bought it. Johnny does great work. <laughs> you, you, Mark, what did we just say about the whole fangirling thing? I know, I know, I know. Right, so I have a question, rapid fire questions. Uh, okay, yeah, that's good because that's going to be the last one, Mark. So it better be brilliant. All right. Yeah. All right so you, we talked playlist. What's your playlist for shotguns and sorcery? Oh, man. You know, I go back and actually, I've been doing it for so long. I think I started out with the Incredibles, actually. And uh, nowadays, sometimes I'll stick on um, the soundtrack from Blade Runner, right? Uh, both uh, the new one and the old one. Uh, and then sometimes I'll just stick on the Lord of the Rings role playing, uh, not the, role, the Lord of the Rings uh, soundtracks as well, just to get me in the mood for that kind of stuff, right? That fantasy stuff. So, um, and then sometimes I just have a playlist with shit I already know. And I'm like, I'm just grooving, right? I'm just going crazy. But nice. um but, you know, for me, the shotguns and sorcery is such a strange mix of different genres that I just love. And that's the reason it tickles me to death. And honestly, if nobody ever reads it or, or buys it, all, I'll say, you guys are missing out. But I mean, really, I do it for me, right? I do it because I, I enjoy it because it's a, a, a melange of my favorite things. And I just want to share that with people. Awesome. Now, I know Fox. it sounds cheesy, but there you go. Oh, that's fantastic. No, you're allowed to be cheesy. This is your podcast. Oh, you have to be cheesy about your own work. If you're not, who else is going to be? <laughs> exactly. Mark, just give him five more minutes. No, just yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah. We're getting there. We're getting there. Okay. The bills cool. will kick in in a few minutes, and that'll be it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Okay. Well, we are at the end of this podcast, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Uh, You've been amazing to talk to. This has been so much fun. But I would like you to talk about Shotguns and Sorcery again. Sure. I got to plug my thing. That's why I'm here. We're doing yeah. a Shotguns and Sorcery uh, Kickstarter. based. We're going to do a fifth edition source book for this for Dungeons and Dragons. We're not allowed to say Dungeons and Dragons because it's a trademark. Uh, fifth edition source book for Shotguns and Sorcery. Um, which takes it back to its role-playing game roots. And Shotguns and Sorcery is basically fantasy noir in which a uh, the uh, a horde of zombies under the ruler of the dead have taken over the entire continent, forced the free peoples of the, of the, of the continent into one area where there's a mountain, and they make it a deal with the dragon to protect them while they actually build a wall and create a city that he can then rule over as a dragon emperor. <laughs> Cut to 500 years later, where uh, it's... Technology and, and magic have kind of melded. So instead of electric lights, you have glow globes everywhere that activate it at a touch. You, instead of hailing a taxi, you hail a flying carpet, takes you to whatever part of the country or the city you want to be at. Uh, and while you're doing this all though, there are, are uh, zombies scratching at the wall outside. And it's all stratified, strat stratified by race, by fantasy race. So at the top, you have the dragon emperor. Then there's the elves, the most long lived next to them below that. And then the dwarves and their stronghold and the, you know, and the gnomes and the halflings and then the humans. And then down by the wall, you have the green peoples, the orcs and the goblins and everything else who live in this terrible place, uh, which is crime ridden and everything else. But that's where you have to go a lot of times for the most interesting adventures. And it's it's great uh, hard boiled detective noir stories with a fantasy twist on them. And this way you get to play those kind of things with your 5e game. And have fun. Amazing. And we're starting a Kickstarter. Go to shotgunsandsorcery.com and it'll take you directly to either the Kickstarter page or the pre launch page, depending on when you get to it. And then you can uh, pledge for this. We're going to be running until I think November 11th, starts October 29th, goes to or October 26th, goes to November 16th. So if you manage to get in between those, you'll get them. I am actually not interested in selling this stuff to, to uh, distri distribution. So most of these books are just going to go directly to readers, players, et cetera, to, uh, to game players, um, because I just don't want to dick around with, you know, selling in stores. I mean, a lot of stores are great stores. I have lots of friends who run wonderful stores, but uh, the idea that they really got to put this next to Dungeons and Dragons and Pathfinder and everything else, and I have to fight for a spot. I'm like, no, I'm going direct to consumer. You guys get to buy this stuff. And, you know, once I'm done printing these, probably you'll be able to get it on PDF and print on demand after that. But these will be the only uh, classically printed copies available. So get it while you can. I was going to say, get it while you can. And not only that, there's a tier. Apparently, you actually get to play the role-playing game. Yes. With... Well, there isn't yet, but there will be by the time I'm done with this. <laughs> yep. Well, this hasn't come out yet, so I'm going to try again. There's going to be a tier. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Do role-playing 
with Four funds. Matt and his son. I, I can do this. Like even That's, with no, alcoholic no, it's beverages. Good. This like, is the nature of Kickstarter, right? This is why I love Kickstarter. I ran a bunch of Kickstarters in the past, but Kickstarter is basically like, I got a great idea. Let's put on a play, darling. We'll save the town, right? It's let, you know, let's put the money up there. We'll put an idea up there. See if anybody salutes the flag, right? And if they do, then you got a product. Then you, you run for it. Honestly, if they don't, that's fine. I would much rather have a product crash and burn in a Kickstarter than me mortgaging a house, putting it out there, running it through distribution, getting in stores, and not knowing for a year or two of total freaking dedicated effort if it was going to make it or not. I would much rather have my heart broken on day one than on you know two years down the line. So ideally, folks, you don't break my heart. You all love it. And it's all great. But uh, the, the beauty of Kickstarter is being able to put up an idea and see if it has wings before you actually have to kick it out of the nest. And your son is a part of this one. Yes, my son, Marty, who's my eldest son, who's just a huge gamer and just loves this stuff and has been growing up watching me do this, has been to Gen Con since he was like nine years old. Uh, uh, he's actually doing all the game mechanics for this for fifth edition. He's a huge fan of this. Uh, he's done a fantastic job with it. I couldn't be prouder. Uh, and I'm really excited to have the rest of the world see what he can do. So you got your son and a veteran game creator. Exactly. Shotguns and sorcery. What more could you want? I'm exploiting his cheap time. labor. No, actually, I'm paying him well. That's. I was going to say you're not. You know, uh, you should just let me go at this. No, no, no. It's, it's just, no you're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, people are like, oh, he's your son. You're just. What? I'm like, you know what? My first conversation I had with Marty was like, I need to pay you a, a decent wage right? This is not something you should ever be doing for free for anybody. And you certainly should be doing it for peanuts. Um, so Marty, I pay 10 cents a word, which is pretty good for a starting writer. Yeah. And I, I pay anybody who's working for me that kind of rate, because I think that if you can't make a game product or any product and pay somebody a decent wage, you shouldn't be doing it, right? You should go right. off and do it yourself, whatever, show it to your friends. But if you're actually trying to publish and you want to run a business with it, you should be paying your people an honest wage who are working with you, whether they're your family or not. Right. I agree completely. I think a lot of times people forget that creatives, regardless of the creative, just because they're friends with you doesn't mean they can give you their art for free. Exactly. Plus, this way he doesn't have to move back home. Right. It's all good. It all works. Go. Out. That's the important win, part. Win, win. Yep. win, 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 win. Okay. Exactly. We're all happy. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on this podcast. I really appreciate you joining us. Well, thank you, Erica, for having me and Mark as well. I appreciate it. it was a lot oh, of absolutely. Pleasure. It was all mine, a hundred percent. So I'm, I'm having a hell of a time with this little That's all I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> it makes everything better, right? Exactly. Okay. Oh my goodness. Okay, this has been Drinking with Authors Literary Briefs Edition. I've been your host, Eric Lamps. My co-host has been Mark Muncy from at Erie, Florida. And our guest has been Matt Borbeck, Shotguns and Sorcery. I'm going to say it again. Guys, go check out that Kickstarter. Get your edition of this book and then show up to Gen Con with the book and get Matt and Marty to sign it for you. He won't He's laugh so at you this time. I promise. Marty is not signed anything yet. He'd be so excited. It'd be so cool. <laughs> yeah. So do that. Marty might laugh. It might be the first time That's for him, true. but Matt will rein him in and get him to sign I'll, the book for you. I'll call him in. I'll use the shepherd. My hook, first Gen Con know. in 10 years. So I might be that guy doing that. Oh, fantastic. That'd be awesome. Oh, that'll be amazing. Okay, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much.